Thank you much, ladies. We're continuing this morning in our series in the book of Proverbs. And remember, last week we began a short two-part series within the series. We looked at some of the characteristics of a fool, as the word fool appeared more than, in, in some form, appeared more than 80 times alone in the book of Proverbs. So it's something very, very important. God doesn't want us to be fools. Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the reverse of that. And we're going to talk about what it means to see some of the characteristics of the wise. Now last week, as a means of review, I gave you guys an acronym. And I gave you the word SAD, S-A-D, which kind of fits because fools are kind of sad, you know. Uh, but anybody remember what the S stands for? Stubborn, right? Fools are stubborn. They, they, want, they think they're always right. They're the ones that are going to plant, plant their feet in and they ain't going to hear anybody else except what they believe to be true. What does the A stand for? Angry. Yep, they're just some, they, when they're mad, they just put it out there and you know it. And lastly, D, what was D stand for? Disrespectful. That's right. Sometimes they just don't care about what they say. Their mouth always gets them in trouble. Man, you guys were listening last week. Look at that. You guys just said it real quick with the acronym, right? Now, I will say this. I tried really, really hard today to come up with an acronym because I thought, man, that acronym went over well last week, and I'm sorry I couldn't do it, okay? I'm sorry. I tried. I, 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 was, even on the, I was on the computer looking up the thesaurus, looking up different words for concepts I wanted to try and make a little three or four letter acronym, and I just couldn't do it today, okay? But today we're going to look at the opposite of what a fool is, and we're going to look at the characteristics of the wise. Now, I told you the word fool in some form appears 80 plus times in the book of Proverbs. Well, the word wise or wisdom or something to that nature in some form appears 125 times alone in the book of Proverbs. Now, when we talk about wisdom, that's kind of a tricky thing to define. We take that word for granted. It's usually linked with the idea of knowledge, the acquisition of knowledge, like receiving knowledge and then doing something with that knowledge. Some have said that wisdom is the practical application of knowledge. But I would submit to you that I believe that the concept is significantly deeper than that. The most used Hebrew word for the, for the word wisdom basically is translated, if we translate it into English, skill or skillfulness, okay? So wisdom encompasses being skillful in one's relationship with God and others in our attitudes and actions throughout all of life, okay? So let me say that again. Wisdom encompasses being skillful in one's relationship with God and others in all of our attitudes and actions in all of life. Now Paul Larson in his book, Wise Up and Live, love that title, gives a good overall concept of the word wisdom, and this is the way he defines it. He says, when a man knows the right and does the right, he is a wise man. It is the wedding, I like that word, the wedding of knowing and doing. It's this combination. It is the junction of the good and the true. So there's an intersecting kind of principle here. Yes, it involves receiving something information, but then it also uh, involves the action that goes with it. So our knowledge informs the way that we live our lives, and hopefully we live in a wise and skillful way. So for us who name ourselves as believers in Jesus, we need to exhibit the character of the wise in all of our attitudes and actions every day. Now, if you have your Bibles today, you can try to follow along with me. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to be jumping in a few different texts and Proverbs. But if not, you can follow with me behind on the screen. And today we're going to talk about three specific characteristics of the wise. And as I said, I'm sorry in advance I couldn't come up with an acronym for you, okay? But the first thing we're going to see about the wise is that they listen to counsel. The first verse that we're going to read, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15, you'll remember from last week. We read the first portion of it. So actually, I told you that a lot of times the fool is contrasted or compared to the wise. And we're going to look at the, we're going to look at the ending part of that verse. So here is Proverbs 12, 15 in its totality. It says this, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. That's what we talked about last week. But a wise man is he who listens to counsel. So as opposed to a fool who thinks that they're always right, is always willing to give you their opinion without being asked, who's always willing to steadfast and not be moved and to always uh, believe that they have the right answer, a wise man is willing to listen to the counsel of others. 
Remember I told you last week that the reason why this is foolish, the beginning part of this verse, is because you and I do not have a monopoly on all knowledge. There's only one person who does, and his name is God, okay? He's the only one who has a monopoly on all knowledge. Now, you guys remember, when we're talking about the beginning part of this verse, I want you to think about that toilet story I told you last week, okay? And I'm not going to repeat it for you. Those of you that missed it, you'll laugh. Just listen to it online. So, here's what I want us to understand something, okay? The wise man listens to the counsel of others, but Proverbs not only presents the idea that he actually listens, it's the idea of listening actively to actually do. Not only does the wise man listen, but he actively seeks out the counsel of others as well. He's not, uh, how can I say, he's not ashamed or he is not uh, too proud to be able to seek the counsel of others. So if we look at the next verse that I want to bring to your attention, Proverbs eleven fourteen, it says this, where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in the, but in the abundance of counselors, there is victory. Now the word guidance is a very interesting word in Proverbs eleven fourteen. The word guidance is a nautical term. When you think about that term, I want you to think about steering a ship or for you land dwellers who don't maybe like to see, maybe uh, think about steering your car. It's like your steering wheel, okay? It's like you're directing the, the way in which the things should go. So when we have a multiplicity of people that can speak into our lives, then what happens is it often guides us in the place where we need to go. It guides us in the right direction. It can be extremely helpful, and it actually displays wisdom to actually seek out that, cons that con uh, counsel. Because when we don't seek the counsel, sometimes what happens is we can make grave mistakes, especially when we're making decisions on things that we truly may not know about. Now, when I was thinking about this concept, I was thinking about that when you look at the Bible, there's a number of different Bible characters, some of our favorite ones as well, that we see that throughout Scripture that they received good counsel, that they actually sought out counsel and were affirmed in, th in courses of their lives were changed because of the counsel in which they sought. Sometimes God specifically put a person in their path in order to give them counsel. Let me give you a specific example. If you look at the story of Joseph, okay, in Genesis chapter 37, basically through Genesis like 44, if you look at the story of Joseph, one of the beautiful things about that story is because numerous times over we hear that wherever Joseph went, even though that that was a non-godly place in Egypt, that wherever he went, whether it was Potiphar's household, whether it was in prison, or whether it was in the actual court of Pharaoh himself, that everything that he basically said and he did, everything he touched turned to gold. God blessed him and was with him. As a matter of fact, if Pharaoh had not listened to his counsel, who had not listened to the counsel of a guy who was sold into slavery, who was a Hebrew, who wasn't even really rightfully to be in place inside of the Egyptian palace, if Pharaoh had not listened to him, if Pharaoh was too proud, then the destruction of the whole entire nation would have happened. And the destruction of the whole entire known world at that time really would have happened because that's how severe the famine was. But we know Joseph gave Pharaoh great counsel and Pharaoh trusted Joseph. I love the fact that when you read about Potiphar, Potiphar, what he says about Joseph and what Pharaoh says really mirror each other. Potiphar says, hey, just don't make me late for dinner. I trust this guy with my whole entire household. And he said, I don't even have to worry. Then Pharaoh goes to the next step. He says, basically, I trust this guy with the whole entire country. I don't have to worry either. Just don't make me late for dinner okay just let me know when I'm gonna eat and I'll let him control everything that's a lot of favor but he listened to wise and godly counsel the other person I thought about was Moses remember what happens with Moses in Exodus 18 think about leading millions of people inside the wilderness and you're kind of the spiritual leader of the people in this wilderness so this would be like me the pastor and I'm leading millions of people I, number one, I could not even imagine that. That would be, whoo, Lord help me. But so you're leading millions of people, right? So you're out in the wilderness and all these people are coming to you for spiritual guidance. So Moses would basically spend all day and night listening to people as they would come before him, asking him for spiritual guidance and wisdom. His father-in-law, Jethro, who was a believer, looks at him, he says, dude, uh, you need to stop that. You're looking a little tired. Okay, you're not really doing a service to the people because you're really hurting them by just, you know, you need to assign some people and delegate this out because you're going to kill yourself. So what does Moses do? Moses listens to the counsel of his father-in-law. 
Moses could have easily said, who are you, bro? Who do you think you are? I'm the leader of this group of people. God called me to lead these millions of groups of people. He said, you know, he could have said, hey, I'm God's man of power for the hour. Who are you to tell me what I should do? But no, he listened to the counsel of his father-in-law. It says that he assigned some to be like leaders over hundreds, some to be leaders over fifties, uh, 50 groups of people, you know, whatever it was. And he delegated out the responsibility all because he listened to the advice of his father-in-law. I believe that this principle is extremely important for Christians and people in general. If you think about it, for example, if you own your own business, okay, that's what I love about Proverbs. We're going to talk real practical. If you own your own business and say you were struggling with keeping the books, all right, maybe you're not too savvy when it comes to, you know, the administration side or whatever, you're not just going to go talk to some person who has no background in that area, right? That would be foolish. That would be a foolish decision. So what you would do is you would seek out the counsel of maybe a, uh, you know, a professional, a CP, uh, CPA or something, okay? You seek out the counsel of them, and they would be able to direct you, tell you what to do with your books, maybe look at your numbers, all that other stuff. If you own your own personal business, right? That would be smart. Now, say if you're a married couple, and you're struggling with your relationship, and you need help in your relationship. So you're not going to seek out somebody who, uh, you know, is maybe going through struggles in their relationship as well, and they, they aren't the most happily married couple, right? What you're going to do is you're going to seek out somebody, you should seek out somebody who maybe is uh, more seasoned in the Lord, been married a long time, learned some practical wisdom from them. But often we seek a professional, a marriage counselor, somebody who's a Christian therapist, somebody who can help us out, give us some tools to be able to help and enrich our marriage. As a minister, the same rings true for me, as I often seek out the counsel of a very selected group of people who have, I have given access to be able to speak into my life. People like Richard Gay, who's the pastor of Central, uh, Central Church here in Ewing, who has been a great friend to me and who meets with me on monthly. On a monthly basis, we have lunch. He prays for me. He encourages me. He asks, I ask him questions about certain things related to ministry because I'm only two years into this thing as opposed to a guy who has 20 plus years of ministry experience. And I'm so thankful for the wisdom that he offers me. My buddy Landon and Kelly Kiker of Livingstone Church in San Antonio, who Jen and I consider to be our best friends in ministry that we've known for the past 10 plus years. We've done ministry. We've literally grown up in ministry together. And it's always great to talk with him and just be able to bounce ideas off of him. Or my spiritual father, who many of you have met, Pastor Jose Neves of Thy Kingdom Come Church in my hometown, New Bedford, Massachusetts, who encouraged me to follow out the call of God when I was a 16-year-old kid coming off the street and just living that kind of lifestyle, encouraging me to follow the call of God that he saw upon my life and always encouraging me. We need people like that that we grant access to because of our level of relationship with them to be able to speak the truth and love in our lives. Not to just be yes men and women. I'm not talking about people who are yes men and women because these people will tell me when I'm wrong and I've given them access to my life to be able to uh, graciously rebuke me when necessary. But we all need people like that. Just because, but let me give you a word of caution here. And I'm going to give you, this is a freebie before we get to the principle, okay? Here's my word of caution to you. And we could spend a whole sermon or sermon series on this. Just because somebody is willing to give you counsel does not mean that it's the counsel you should seek. Did you hear what I just said? Just because somebody's willing to give you counsel does not mean it's the counsel you should seek. It doesn't mean that you have to listen to every voice that is willing to actually speak into your life. That actually is kind of a little bit about what we talked about with the fool last week a little bit, okay? They need to be people who you have relationship with. They need to be people who know you, people who really have your best interest in mind. So we need to be wise to whom we allow to speak into our life. That's a free principle for you today, okay? No charge for that one. You need to be wise about who you allow to speak into your life. Because when you have that level of access, sometimes what happens is you want to have that level of access, but then we could just blindly follow the advice of others and it eventually could be destructive as opposed to constructive, okay? Here's the principle I want to give you in light of what we just talked about in Proverbs, that God has given us a gift in others through whom we can receive guidance. The body of Christ is supposed to be brothers and sisters, and the scripture tells us that we're to encourage one another in our most holy faith. The Bible also talks about iron sharpening iron. 
So especially as biblical believers, this is a great thing because we can see each other as gifts. We can see each other as having differing abilities, different natural talents and spiritual gifts that God gives to the, the, to the multiplicity of the body of Christ in order that the fullness of ministry can take place. So then we can be able to seek out counsel from our brothers and sisters, those whom we have relationship with, who we know that they have a certain level of knowledge in a certain area. That's why I love how the Bible talks often about how the older are supposed to invest into the younger. And that's not just talking about age. That's talking about spiritual maturity. So when we're talking about spiritual maturity, discipleship is supposed to be a personal, intimate thing where we are able to encourage one another in our most holy faith. That's what the Bible, the body of Christ is supposed to be, living intimate relationships where we can be genuine with one another, where we can love one another, we can encourage one another, we can even graciously correct one another when we need to and be able to learn from one another. So the second thing I want you to see, the first thing we talked about is that the wise person is able to listen to counsel. You know what that is? That's kind of the opposite of what we talked about the stubborn person last week. That's the opposite of the yes, okay? The second thing I want you to see is that a wise person is calculated with their words. Now, I selected that word very carefully. Calculated can have a negative connotation, but I'll bring it to light what I mean by that. I'm not talking about we manipulate people with our words, okay? Look at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. It says this. When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. I love that. When there are many words, transgression or sin is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. This is kind of the opposite of when we talked about being disrespectful last week. As the fool's mouth always got him into trouble, the wise person knows when they are to talk and when they shouldn't. Sometimes the best thing you can do in walking in wisdom is just to keep your lips shut. Sometimes things are better left unsaid than actually said. That's what I mean by calculated. The wise person is able to think about, is it really profitable for me in this particular situation to actually voice my opinion or try to give advice, or is it actually more advisable for me to just keep quiet? So they're calculated in that way. Sometimes those things are just better left unsaid. Because I love how the beginning of this verse says, it says, when there are many words, transgression is, unvo uh, is unavoidable. Sometimes when you talk too much, there is a, a very good chance that you're going to say something that offends people. There's a very good chance that you're going to say something, it may not be deliberate either, that you're, gonna, uh, that you're unintentionally going to hurt somebody. So sometimes we have to be a little more calculated with our words. So I would say that the ability to remain silent really is a skill. That's what being wise is, right? We talked about skillfulness, being a skill. It really is a skill because sometimes you know what I'm talking about. All right, let's not act all holier than now right now, okay? You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes when somebody's talking to you and you feel like, man, I just want to give them my two cents so bad right now. You know, something's kind of boiling in you. It's like, man, that's just stupid, you know, and just like, you just kind of like, you, you, you want to, you, you just clenching your fist and biting your lips because you just want to say something, but sometimes it's just better left unsaid, right? Look at Proverbs twelve eighteen. it says this, here's kind of another layer to this, and it says, there is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword, now listen to that, but the tongue of the wise brings healing, so there is one who speaks rashly. That's the idea like we talked about last week, about being disrespectful. They don't think before they speak. So the fool is like thrusting a sword inside of a person. It feels like that sometimes as they're hurting each other, as they're hurting people with their words. Remember, sticks and stones really do, you know, and words may never hurt me, that, that's bogus. Words do hurt. So it's like sticking, that, sticking a sword inside of somebody. He says, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. I love that. It's such a vivid image. Because Solomon is contrasting here how the person who is a fool is so easily able to cause destruction and bring hurt onto somebody as opposed to somebody who is wise, they can speak words of life and bring healing to a person who is very, very hurt. Our words have the power to build up or to destroy. Solomon here says the words of the wise bring healing instead of hurt. Here's the principle that if you don't catch anyone today, I want you to catch this and walk away with this. This is tweetable stuff right here, okay? Listen to this. 
Life-giving words at the right time can have a positive effect for a lifetime. Life-giving words at the right time can have a positive effect for a lifetime. I think that's the gist of what Solomon's trying to get at. He's encouraging the person who is wise, those words are able to bring healing upon the most broken of hearts. It's literally like sapping just the love of Jesus and just encouraging people and just, and just overflowing it and throwing it on top of them, okay? And it's able to bring healing even to those most intimate parts of our heart that may have been hurt by some of the things that people said, maybe even some years and years and years ago. But it's so amazing that the right word at the right time has such a positive effect that can literally uh, catapult us to like that next level in our spirituality. Can kind of be that hope that we need to be able to get us through who knows the week that we're going to be going through that God knows. God gives us just the right word at the right time and it literally can change the course of somebody's life. For Pastor Jose to tell me as a 16-year-old kid coming off the street trying to be the, you know, live that kind of gangster lifestyle, telling me, you know what, that God has a purpose and a plan for my life and that he saw the spiritual gift of God in me and being able to lead me to Jesus and kind of encourage me, those words changed the course of my life. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Jose Neves, okay? They changed the course and direction of my whole entire life just because I received an encouraging word right at the right time. Now, maybe you've experienced this before. You know, when you've been down in the dumps and the encouraging word you needed came just at the right time. You know, the saying goes that God is never early and he's never late, but he's always on time. That very much rings true. Because how many times you may have been down in the dumps during the week and you've had this experience like I have, a phone call comes right at the right time. A friend calls right at the right time and says, hey, I've been thinking about you. I've been praying for you. How are you doing this week? Sometimes that card comes in the mail. I know, if you I know a lot of you like to send cards, and that's so great. And I've gotten some of your cards sometimes, and I'm just so encouraged. Like, and it just comes right at the right time when that card comes in the mail and just speaks a few words of life over you. Or maybe it's sometimes when you're in your personal quiet time with the Lord and you're reading the scripture and all of a sudden it's like the words jump off the page to you and God ministers something to your heart and you just know that that's for you today. Or you're listening to Christian radio, all of a sudden that song comes on that moves you to tears while you're driving to work just because God is ministering something to you through that song. God knows what you need. And he is more than willing to meet those needs and he does it in such a beautiful, miraculous way that we know it's him. That it can't be anything else. That we know that it is him and we know, and, and what's so beautiful about that is because as much as we think that sometimes that he doesn't care, that shows us his intimate personal level of care, that he cares for us no matter what we're going through at that very moment. That's how much God loves us. He gives us that perfect word right at the right time. Just this past week, I received a few texts from a couple different people uh, praying for us during vacation Bible school and just said, hey, you know, some of our old friends from our old church in Texas, and they just said, hey, we were thinking about you this week, and I just finished praying for you and just wanted to see how it was going. And God just does that right at the right time because he's so good to us. He knows what we need. It's easily, it's very easy for us to be discouraged in this world. And oftentimes we just need that simple word, we need that simple hug, we need that prayer, we need something just to be able to elevate us and just to get us through, just to be able to give us that level of encouragement. And God knows you so much that he sends the person, he sends the song, he sends the card, he sends the phone call right exactly when you need it. So the first two things we saw about the wise person is that the wise person listens to counsel and then the second thing we saw that they're very calculated with their words. Because words have power. They can build up or they can destroy. The last thing I want you to see is that the wise person is a learner. Uh, look at this. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 9 says this. It says, give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wise. Teach a righteous man and he will increase his learning. So this is kind of like a, a, a repeat of the same thing, just worded differently in these two verses, and it's in these two lines, and it's specific for emphasis, okay? So a wise person is a perfect example of that old saying. You know that old saying that says this, give a man a fish and feed him for a day, teach a man how to fish and feed him for a lifetime. 
A wise person is a perfect example of that old adage. A wise person not only realizes that they've learned a certain level, but they realize that they desire to learn even more. They want to know more to make themselves better people, to make themselves better Christians. They want to continue to receive instruction, and they will receive it in a way that's well, that they will appropriate it to their lives, and it will cause them to further grow. Because knowledge is valuable. Because the more that we know, the more we can act in a way that is fitting to the knowledge that which we have received. Okay? Look at this. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 14 says this. The beginning part says that wise men store up knowledge. Proverbs 18, 15 says that the mind of the prudent or the mind of the wise, depending upon your translation, acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. So according to that first verse, chapter 10, verse 14, the wise man stores up the knowledge. So it's like a wise man receives some type of knowledge and he like puts it in the data bank of his mind. He keeps it. He dwells upon it. He reflects upon what he receives. That's the idea. He knows when he has to tap into the vault. Verse 18 Chapter 18, verse 15, the mind of the prudent acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. So not only do they desire knowledge, but they seek after it and they listen for it. I remember C.S. Lewis was quoted as saying that all wisdom is God's wisdom. And the reason why I love that is because sometimes we can receive very practical wisdom from people who are not even Christians. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have a certain order to the universe. It doesn't mean that we can't learn necessarily practical things about life from people who aren't Christians. But here's the thing is that we always take the knowledge we receive and level it up against the word of God. The word of God will always be our standard. But if it's not contrary to the word of God, we can receive knowledge from everywhere. And that's what I love what C.S. Lewis said. He said, because all of that is God's knowledge. It's God's wisdom anyway. And he allows us to appropriate it to our lives. Let me tell you this cool story. Now, I'm a guy who likes philosophy. Now, I know some of you may not like philosophy. Philosophy is like thinking about thinking, you know, but I love philosophy. And as a matter of fact, I wanted to be, um, yeah, some of you caught that. Some of you didn't catch that. Don't worry. Catch it on the tape. Um, now, I love philosophy because uh, some of these guys, I mean, just they, their, their minds, just to think about, they didn't relate some of the things that they knew to God. Some of them did, but not necessarily the God of the Bible. But it's just amazing how some of these people just under, understood certain things. So a young man came to Socrates one day, and he said this in substance, Mr. Socrates, I have come 1,500 miles to gain wisdom and learning. I want learning, so I have come to you. Socrates said, come and follow me. He led the way down to the seashore. They waded out into the water until they were up to their waist. Then Socrates seized his companion and forced his head under the water. In spite of his struggles, Socrates held him under. Finally, when most of the resistance was gone, Socrates laid him out on the shore and returned to the marketplace. So not only does he drown, halfway drown this dude, he leaves him on the shore and then just leaves him, okay? Uh, I'd, be, I'd call this evangelically upset at that point, okay? Now listen to what happens, though. When the visitor regained his strength, he returned to Socrates and wanted to learn the reason behind his behavior. And this is what Socrates said. I love this. When you were under the water, what was the one thing you wanted more than anything else? The man responded, I wanted air. Then Socrates said, when you want knowledge and understanding as badly as you want air, you won't have to ask anybody to give it to you. I love that. When you want knowledge and understanding badly as you wanted air, you will not have to ask anybody to give it to you. What's the point I'm trying to make? Is that as we pursue knowledge, the pursuit of knowledge is an active thing. It's active. It's not passive. You don't receive knowledge through osmosis. You can't just stand next to somebody and all of a sudden download something into your brain. As technical as we are as society, we haven't found out how to work that yet, okay? So we can't wire brain to brain and just download information like we're computers. Knowledge, the pursuit of it, is an active pursuit. Think about this for a second. It's the same way in our personal relationship with Christ. 
Because the Bible talks about knowing God. Now, when it talks about knowing God, it's not talking about knowing information. Knowledge only gets you to a certain level. It's talking about, yes, knowing information, but then also living out that information. That's where the wisdom comes. Actually knowing about God, living in relationship to what I know about him. But it's an active pursuit. The Bible talks about us having like this kind of intimate personal relationship with Jesus. Well, if you want to have an intimate personal relationship with God and you want to know him, it's something you have to be active in. It's not just coming to church on Sunday, listening to a good sermon, singing a few songs. It's no, actually passionately pursuing, understanding and knowing your God. That happens through prayer. That happens through the study of the scripture. That happens through conversations with other believers. That happens through things that we listen, things we observe in nature as we see the beautiful glory and grandeur of God on display. It happens in so many different ways. We have to desire to know him. Desire is where it begins, but then we have to actively pursue knowing our God. It's not just enough for us as believers today to just know even our God. We have to know the people that we're trying to reach. Our society out there is forever changing. The, cult, the winds of culture are forever changing. And it's not that we become experts on all things, but we need to know something about the people that we're trying to reach. We have to be able to have an intelligent conversation with the people that we're trying to reach. To know what, the, to, to know what they're being taught in school, to know kind of what they're thinking. Upon, how, upon the lines of how are we going to reach them. Here's another freebie for you. I said it like this. A wise person knows the Lord and knows his world. Okay? A wise person knows the Lord and knows his world. It always begins with God first. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So it begins with God first. Okay? So that's where all of it begins because it traces back to him. But not only are we supposed to know our God, we're supposed to know the world in which he wants us to reach. That doesn't mean we have to be, that means we're in the world and not of it. doesn't mean we have to necessarily emulate the world, but we do have to know the people that we're trying to reach. So a wise person knows his God and knows his world. Let me summarize this for you today. The first principle we talked about is that God has given us a gift in others through whom we can receive guidance. So this was listening to counsel. Remember, a wise person not only listens to counsel, they're willing to actually seek it out. And they actually, they look for people that are knowledgeable about what they're wanting to know. And they actively listen, not just where it goes into the ear, where it goes into the heart and is reflected out in action. The second thing we talked about is how life-giving words at the right time can have a positive effect for a lifetime. So a wise person is calculated with their words. Remember, they're not like the fool. They're not that just their mouth gets them in trouble. They're not the ones willing just to spit out and say things that are so egregious that they don't even think about what they're communicating. They know when to speak and when not to speak. And lastly, the pursuit of knowledge is an active one. A wise person is a learner. We are always to be lifelong learners. Because I don't know about you, but as a believer, the re I've been, let's see, when I went to school, I went to school when I was 17 years old. I graduated when I was 29. Or, uh, no. Yeah, 29. So I graduated when I was 29 years old from school, right? Or 28, one of those bouts. So, whatever it is. So whether it's 11 or 12 years, 11 or 12 years I went to basically Bible school. From one school for two years, then finishing my undergrad, and then six years for my master's degree, okay? All that, and I still realize the more I know, I come to know about God, the, realize, the more I realize that I need to know so much more. The more that I realize I've barely scratched the surface upon the depths of who God is. And while here on this earth, I will constantly be in pursuit of knowing my God. And I will not be able to fully know and understand him until I stand before him face to face, unveiled when my faith shall be my sight. But that's what's beautiful because the pursuit of knowledge is an active one. We are to be lifelong learners. Even though we may have a certain level of wisdom, the moment that we think that we've arrived and we've capped that is the moment that we've handicapped ourselves and the moment when we stopped growing. There is no kind of staying stale in the biblical life. You're growing or sometimes we're retracting, okay? But Jesus wants us to grow. All right, so how are we going to put this into practice? Simple. Be wise. 
This is deeply profound stuff here. Last year I told you to put it in practice. Don't be a fool. This week I'm just telling you to be wise. Now, I don't have a chart for you like last week either. Sorry, I couldn't find a chart and I didn't have time with Vacation Bible School to put one together. Uh, but I want you to seek this out, okay? I want to give you an exercise. Now, on the back, in the back of probably 90% of your Bibles, there's a thing called the concordance, okay? Now, what a concordance is, is the concordance actually lists out all of the words that are found often in your Bible, and you can look up the word wisdom or the word wise, and then right alongside of it, it's going to tell you the actual verse in which those words appear. Now, like I said, the word wise in some form appears some 125 times in the book of Proverbs. My exercise for you would be, I would challenge you during your devotional time this week to do your devotional through the book of Proverbs. And this is what you can do. You can look up the word wise, look up some of those other different verses, and look to see what you find out about those who are wise. And then maybe that informs the way that you pray and say, God, help me to act in this way. Help me to be wise in this way. Maybe it's an area where you're not strong in. And maybe it's something that God can encourage you to grow in. But I would encourage you to do your devotional time through the book of Proverbs this week. Look up, those, look up some passages that may speak to you about wisdom and about the wise. And then appropriate those to your life, okay? Well, I am going to pray and then I'm going to do something really quick before we close out. All right, so let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for the opportunity to share a little wisdom from Solomon, but also to know what it means to live in a way that is skillful, a way that is in accordance with your will. And Lord, help us to be wise and not to be fools. Help us to live a life that is pleasing to you. Help us to be ones that are always learning, Lord, to know the world in which we can reach for your gospel. Help us to know our God above all, though, Lord. Help us to desire it for it as much as Socrates said to that man that we desire air, Lord. May that desire be so emblazoned within us to know you, to know you intimately and personally. And I thank you that we can have the opportunity to do that. You have, that that veil has been torn, that we've been granted access directly to God. And that as those who are believers in Jesus, that you already reside in our heart. It's the Holy Spirit. And thank you that we can read your word, we can pray and communicate with you, we can talk with others about you, Lord, to be able to know how to better serve you. Help us to practically walk out some of these things. Help us to be people who are wise, Lord, for your name's sake, in Jesus' name. Amen.